was a country, Chino Achebe wrote. And I, for one, think he knew what he was talking about. Because to say there wasn't, to say that Nigeria is the mistake of 1914, that Nigeria is a mere geographical expression, is to discount 1920 and the formation of the Nigerian National Democratic Party by Herbert Macaulay to fight for the rights of people he considered to be his countrymen. It is to discount 1933 and the formation of the Nigerian youth movement by people like Ernest Ticoli from today's Bayelsa, H.O. Davis from today's Lagos, Eyo Ita from today's Cross River to fight for the rights of people they consider to be their countrymen. It is to discount 1944 and the formation of the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, the NCNC, it was formed by students to bring together the two political heavyweights of that time, Namdi Azikiwe and Herbert Macaulay, to bring them together in one organization so they could more effectively fight for the independence of a country these young people considered to be theirs. To say Nigeria is a mere geographical expression is to discount the constitutional conferences that took place in 1951, in 1953, in 1957, 1958, when Nigerians from all walks of life came together, sat down to negotiate and agree the terms under which they were prepared to live together. It is to discount uh, Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa, who in the early 60s took a trip to the United States. And what he saw there made him think to himself that if this nation, with its trajectory, if this country can become a nation, then Nigeria can do it too. And from the States, he wrote a letter back to a friend in Nigeria. In that letter, he said, from today henceforth, I consider myself a Nigerian and nothing else. To say Nigeria is a mere geographical expression is to discount the fact that for a generation of young men and women, Nigeria was an aspiration, a dream, that independence was the fruit of decades of struggle. So when Chino Achebe said there was a country who was expressing nostalgia for a dream that did not come to pass, not very different from the sentiments expressed by Anthony and Nahoro, who, as a young man, he was a young man who in the parliament in 1953 moved the motion for self-government, governance in 1956. But as a much older man, later in his life, he wrote, this is not the Nigeria of our dreams. I know this. I know that this is not the Nigeria of the dreams of Achebe's generation. I know this. I know that there was a coup on the 15th of January 1966 that triggered a catastrophic series of events for this country. I know this. I know there was a pogrom in May, in July, in September of 66, where men, women, and children were killed. Pregnant women had their bellies split open, their babies ripped out, and killed because of their ethnicity. I know this. I know that there was a war, a brutal war, where millions of children starved to death, innocent men, women, and children killed, and till today, there is no plaque, there is no wall, there is no memorial anywhere to remember them. We don't even know what their names were. We don't even know how many people actually died. Some of them, we don't even know where they are buried. I know this. I know that this giant of Africa stumbled right out of the starting blocks and almost collapsed. I know this. I can even understand why it happened. Because our founding fathers, Namdi Azikiwe, Obafemi Awolo, Amadu Bello, our founding fathers were really and truly different. In fact, the fact that those three people were able to work together somewhat to bring Nigeria into independence is testament to their belief in the viability of one Nigeria. That belief was virtually the only thing they had in common. They were really and truly different. Amadu Bello was born in northern Nigeria, raised in northern Nigeria. Northern Nigeria was his cosmos. The first time he went to Lagos, he was in his mid-40s. Obafemi Awolo was born in the western Nigeria, raised, lived there all his life. That was what he knew. Of the two, the one that was slightly different was Zeke. He came from the east, but he was born in the north. Did part of his education in the east, completed it in the west, worked in the west, did his politics in the west. He was the most cosmopolitan. 
So it is very logical that the concept of one Nigeria, of a monolithic Nigeria, of a Nigeria where any Nigerian could represent every Nigerian, regardless of tribe or faith, it's logical that it came naturally to him, because that was his sociocultural background. Amadou Bello had a slightly different concept of one Nigeria. To him, one Nigeria was a federation of the existing regions, the regions that existed at the time, because northern Nigeria was his primary constituency. So he saw Nigeria as a federation of northern Nigeria and all the other regions of Nigeria relating on an equal but independent basis. Obafemi Awolowo had a slightly different idea. Like Amadou Bello, he also, didn't see, he also didn't see Nigeria as one monolithic entity. He saw Nigeria as different groups. But those groups were not the regions. Obafemi Awolowo saw Nigeria as a federation of ethno, ethnic nationalities, because the region he came from was dominated by one ethnic group, the Yorubas. So he saw Nigeria as a federation of ethnic nationalities, where each major ethnic group would have its own political unit from which it could relate to the others on an equal footing. And when we became independent, it was the vision of Amadou Bello that carried the day because Nigeria became independent as a federation of the existing regions. But over time, we have evolved towards the vision of Obafemi Awolowo because over time, different ethnic groups have begun to agitate for greater recognition at the federal level. And that is what has driven the fragmentation of this country from a federation of four regions to a federation of 36 states and one federal capital territory. But what baffles me is that, individually, we have evolved more towards Zeke. Today, Nigerians are more cosmopolitan than ever. 60 years ago, it may have been odd to find a Nigerian who was born outside his place of origin, lives outside of his place of origin, works there, has maybe even lost ties to his place of origin. But today, if I were to ask, how many of you fit this profile? So many hands will go up. There are so many Zeke's sitting here in this room today which begs the question, if we have become more similar over time, why is our politics still as divisive as it was 50 years ago? I can understand it 50 years ago. It was an accurate reflection of their sociocultural reality. But as we have become more similar, why is our politics still locked in the past? There are many reasons for this, but I'll give you two. One, the bedtime stories we've all been told. For instance, you've been told that the Igbos killed the Sadauna. You're not told that the Sadauna was killed by Major Kaduna and Zorgo. What you're told is that the Igbos killed the Sadauna. You're told that the Yorubas betrayed the Igbos. You're not told that Obafemi Awolo was the Commissioner of Finance in Gowon's government during the war, and it was his responsibility to evolve a fiscal strategy for the Nigerian side in the Civil War. No. What you're told is that the Yorubas betrayed the Igbos. You're not told that Muritala Mohammed led the army into Asaba during the Civil War. It was under his watch that the Asaba massacre occurred. No. What you're told is that the Al Fulani murdered the Igbos. And so we keep seeing our social reality through the blinkers of these stories. Our forces us to keep interpreting current facts using models that were invented 50 years ago. Two, the system. Now, I don't care how cosmopolitan you actually are, but at, a point in your, at, a point in, at some point in your journey as a Nigerian, in fact, at many points in your journey as a Nigerian, you will encounter the question, what is your state of origin? And attempting to answer that question will take you straight back to 1966. But you need to answer that question because it gives you access to so many parts of Nigerian public life. It is the answer to that question that will get you an admission in Nigerian public universities. It will get you a job in the Nigerian civil service. It will get you promoted. It will, cost, it will determine your consideration as a, if you're going, ever going to be appointed a minister in this country. It will determine your decision about where to run for public office in this country. And therefore, no matter how you define yourself based on your actual upbringing, at some point you have to accept a label that was created by circumstances 50 years ago. And these factors ensure that as we become more similar, in fact, our politics remains locked in the 50s and the 60s. 
Now, what can we do about this? How can we facilitate integration in this country? For one, we have to tackle it directly. Integration is not a byproduct. It does not just happen. Integration is unnatural. It only happens as a result of deliberate investment in integration. Because there is no nation on earth that is natural. All nations are the deliberate creation of men. To facilitate integration, we have to deliberately and consciously invest in integration as Nigerians. And there are certain aspects of integration we must invest in. One, I'll give you six because of time. One, we have to invest in the infrastructure of integration, in the things that actually connect us physically, like roads. For to be physically isolated is also to be socioculturally isolated. For instance, I cannot tell you the damage, the non-existence of something as simple as the second Niger Bridge. I cannot tell you the damage that has done to the fabric of nationhood in this country. We can't see everything simply in terms of Naira and Kobo and contributions to the GDP. Sometimes we have to evaluate some of these things in terms of their impact on a sense of belonging. For that sense of belonging is as critical to Nigeria's future as the crude oil in the Niger Delta. For this reason, we must consciously invest in the infrastructure of integration, things like roads, things like unity schools, things like the NYSC, things like sports, Nuga Games, the National Sports Festival, things like music and arts, things that naturally connect people. Any government that is thinking seriously about the future of this country has to see these things as strategic investments. Two, we have to invest in the economics of integration. As a rule of thumb, whenever, whenever people feel less secure, whenever they feel poorer, they tend to become more xenophobic. So to invest in security, to invest in a vibrant economy, to invest in growth, is not just to invest in growing the GDP, is also to invest in creating a climate that is conducive to tolerance and integration. Three, we need to invest in the body language of integration. As Nigerians, we must become conscious of the fact that we are living in a highly charged political environment. We are living in a space that is mined, that is fragmented by fault, fault, fault lines, and that a word, any word carelessly spoken or action carelessly taken can provoke a traumatic and extreme reaction from any section of this country. And we need to begin to invest in the language that demonstrates our awareness that we are citizens living in a fragile nation. It's very important. Four, we need to invest in the stories of integration. The only stories we ever hear is how the Igbos killed the Sadawna, how the Alsa Fulani killed the Igbos, how the Yorubas betrayed, how you will never hear how the Emir of Katsina went out of his way to save Igbos during the pogrom. You never hear of the Nigerian soldiers that came into Biafra and, was giving, and were giving water and food to the children they saw. You never hear of Omaru Altini, the Alsa Fulani man who became the first mayor of Enugu. You never hear of Igbos who are winning elections into state houses of assembly in Kano and Lagos. You don't hear these stories because they don't fit the mainstream narrative. Any government that is interested in the future of this country will be investing in pushing those stories. Five, we have to invest in the morality of integration. No matter what your ideology or politics is, I don't know what you think of Nelson Mandela, but you can't take it away from him that the fact that we have a multiracial and democratic South Africa today is a direct result of his decision not to take vengeance of the, on the whites when he had the opportunity. That act was his own investment in the unity and integration of his country. We need more acts like that here in Nigeria. We need people who have suffered harm at the hands of individuals, members of other religious and ethnic groups, who make a decision that when they have the opportunity, they will not take revenge. Because this tit for tat will take us to a dangerous place. As Mahatma Gandhi said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, will leave us both toothless and blind. Also, we need to take, put, you know, the, the Lady Justicia, we need to put the blindfold back on her eyes so that justice in this country is blind, particularly to the ethnic and religious background of the people that stand before it. People should pay for their crime, whatever the reason. If you do the crime, you should do the time. Simple. Lastly, we need to invest in the politics of integration. 
Now, those that don't want Nigeria have effectively politicized their points of view. Over the years, we have developed the capacity to politicize our ethnic and religious differences. But we have failed to develop the capacity to politicize the things we share in common. And what are these things we share in common? What do Nigerians have in common, regardless of faith or tribe? I'll tell you, we have bad roads in common. We have no light in common. We have no books in our schools in common, no drugs in our hospitals in common. That is what we all share. Poverty in Sokoto, poverty in Yenegoa, corruption in Meduguri, corruption in Lagos. Yet, while we've been able to build radical, populist, fanatical movements over our differences, we have been unable to build radical, fanatical, and populist movements over our socio-economic similarities. Because any objective analysis of the facts will show you this, that there is no major ethnic group or religious group in this country that has not produced a political leader at some level of government in this country, which suggests that what we are suffering today has nothing to do with the village the person comes from or the gods that he worships. It has everything to do with the quality of his policy prescriptions and his commitments to executing them. This is an issue that is routinely neglected by those whose politics is defined by identity. Now, I believe that if we are able to invest in all these aspects of integration, then that dream that eluded the generation of Chinua Achebe will become realizable in ours. Officially, this is where my speech ends. <clears throat> But before I step off the stage, um, I would like to do a poem. This poem is titled, The Wall and the Bridge. If a white man turned and called me nigger, my blood would boil in righteous anger, for the evil of discrimination is clearly established when a white man tries to treat me like rubbish. But if Alsa say Igbos are greedy and crude, and Igbos say Alsas are haughty and rude, and he just says Ishekiri must die today, and Eza tells Ezilu there is no other way, If Yorubas declare it is Awo or nothing, and we use federal character to share everything, so before you can even smile and tell me welcome, you must first ask me where my father is from. If those who were settlers but now indigents, say those who are settlers can't become indigents, while the constitution says we are all citizens, look how governments keep issuing certificates of origin. If my brother, pa <laughs> If my brother pass jam but can't go to uni, Because he is Steve and he's not Kanuri, and Unimaid has a quota for its catchment area, so he must go back to Benue or wait one more year. If it's okay to say it's not okay to marry someone just because they are Kalabari and that every tribe should have its own side. <laughs> are we not then practicing apartheid? If you cannot buy land unless you're a native, I cannot find work unless you're a native, I cannot feel safe. Unless you're a native, how can we then say we're not primitive? Yet, you go to London and get their passport, then settle wherever, however you want. You stand there and fight for equality, but come back and start to use ethnicity. I don't get the logic of thinking it's different to be tribalistic and then to be racist. If you're happy to judge him just hearing his name, Whatever you call it, my friend, is the same. Where there is no courage to cross this divide, where there is no faith to look deep inside and stop judging accents and surnames and dressing, this fire we're quenching will only keep burning. Which nation can stand dividing its people? How can one build on foundations so brittle if we cannot see ourselves in each other? This journey ends here. We're going no further. For when God made man, he gave him no facial marks. He did not make Bagi, Okun, or Angas as sure as a black man is just like a white man. No culture is older than being human. This is the truth. Until we accept it, our nation will stumble on its broken feet. For the same things can bind us that drive us apart. For the wall and the bridge are both. in the house. Thank you.